Warning! This podcast contains themes of extreme violence and murder. Subject matter may be offensive to some listeners. Discretion advised. Welcome to another episode of Evil Transgression, your homicide headquarters here in podcasting. I'm Josh, and with me as always, Dustin and Rex. Hello. Hey. Hi. <laughs> what up? Man, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. Mm-hmm. This guy is gonna be a tough one. You think so? Yeah. Yeah? Why's that? I don't know. I just have a feeling. <laughs> It's gonna go rough. Oh, I can't wait. Is there gonna be murder in this one? There's syphilis, <laughs> murder, ooh, ooh, and the nickname of Gorilla Killer. Ooh, ooh. you guys are like, ooh, I hear Gorilla Killer, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> not Harambe, <laughs> please, not Harambe. I'm scared. <laughs> We're not going that route, guys. We're just, I mean, this guy probably has probably one of the race, most racist nicknames we've ever done on the show. Oh, dang. Which sucks, because I have to be the one to read it. <laughs> You'll be all right. Uh, how was everybody's week? Great. Just work, 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 you know. <laughs> Did you get your truck? Uh, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm not surprised. Not. Well... It's coming. Like, it's, that's got to find that right one. Mm, you know? Yeah. You just, you know when you know. It's kind of like when you get, when you find somebody that you want to be with forever. You're like, you just know when you know. You know what I mean? <laughs> what the hell are you talking right, about? Right, Rex? Right? With your wife. Oh, you yeah. knew. Yeah, like, you I knew. knew when you knew. I like, did. I know that I know that I want right to be away. with her forever. And that's what I'm doing with this truck. Mm. I'm actually taking more time trying to find this truck than I did trying to find that's my wife. That's me sleeping. I don't care what you're doing. You have narcolepsy. I don't know how we got from trucks to marriage, mm, but yeah, they just go hand in hand. I guess so. Trucks and marriage go hand they in do. hand. Trucks and marriage. marriage trucks. And okay, marriage. you guys are rich. Making this podcast lame by doing that. You don't remember that show? Yes. Uh, Married, Married with children. children. Yes. Hey, that's a that classic. show would not be on the air today. <laughs> no, it would not. I mean, it was hilarious. And to this day, if I watched it, I would still laugh. Oh, But it would me too. not survive in today's culture. No. Man, even even a show, a, a later show like The Office would not yeah. survive today. I mean, they've already pulled some episodes off. Oh, the, yeah, they have. That's yeah. the greatest. That's my favorite show of all time. Again, that's why for Christmas, Stacy got me the whole DVD set. Yeah. And uh, with none of the episodes and none of the stuff edited, all original. Perfect. Mm hmm. Nice. Uh, are you an Office fan? Um, I watch them whenever they're on. I don't really watch it all that much. Oh, man. I've binged it so many times. So, who are we going to get to replace this on the podcast? Um, you know what? Um, you know what show is better than The Office? There isn't one. Parks and Recreation? He's bound and down. That's a funny one. That is a, that's, that's hilarious. That's funny. But show. I, I, I really love The Office. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's how like, do you not love Michael Scott? Oh, I know. He's the best. Uh, I like him. I like him. He's how do you not him. love Dwight Schrute? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Jim and Pam's romance just touches yeah. my heart. I mean, you know? it, it does. <laughs> they, got, they got married at Niagara Falls. Mm-hmm. They left everybody. It was home. so precious. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm just... just in space. I'm getting so far clipped just thinking about <laughs> like, Well, this uh, episode is not going to be precious. So. Oh, it is precious. It is not. Anything we touch is precious. Anything wrote by you, Dustin, is precious. <laughs> yeah. Pre- oh, he's precious. <laughs> There's Dustin. He's just precious. That's what my grandma used to say to me. <laughs> yeah. That's what they say to a lot of people that are like on the slow end of things. 
Oh, God love him. He's just precious. Here comes Dustin eating paint chips. He's just precious. Dustin, you got paint chips all over your lips. Whatever. You've been licking the window seals again. He's just precious. And Dustin, he's just precious. Oh, man. That's going to be stuck in my head this whole time now. Precious? Yeah. He's just precious. <laughs> all right. Well, let's just get to the brass tacks. Yep. Tell them who we're doing. Earl Nelson? The Gorilla Killer. I want to say Killa. It's Killer, <laughs> Gorilla Killer, because it's back in back in the olden days. Yeah. But for some reason, I want to say Gorilla Killer. They don't. Okay. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> All right. So buckle up, Evil Mob, as we discuss Earl Nelson. Earl Nelson was born May 12th, 1897 in San Francisco, California. Earl was actually born Earl Leonard Farrell, but would go on to change his name, so we're just going to refer to him as Earl Nelson. Sounds good. That avoids some confusion. Right. Yep. Earl would be sent to live with his maternal grandmother at the age of two after both of his parents would die from syphilis. Ooh. So we're already not off to a good start. No. So someone... Was being promiscuous. Mm, promiscuous. A little bit. Earl's grandmother also had two younger children of her own, one eight and one ten years older than Earl himself. The so grandma didn't like to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Earl showed signs of morbid behavior at a young age and was even kicked out of his private school at the age of seven. That's not a good... Start. Uh, start of his childhood no, either. I mean, not at all. Seven years old. Yeah. I mean, your mom and dad died of syphilis. That sucks. You go to live with your grandmother who gets it in. <laughs> and now you're going to private school at seven and they're like, hey, you're morbid, bro. Yeah. You got to go. Well, that's bad. At the age of 10, Earl was riding his bike in the road when a car collided with him, causing him to remain unconscious for six days. Wow. A long time. It's a mm. nice nap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd love a six day nap. <laughs> not that way. <laughs> not That's that not way. How no, you no. Finally, after Earl woke up, he became very aggressive and was said to have frequent headaches and memory loss. That also is not very good. No. No, because now he's got two of like the key things. Like he's got a head injury. Yeah. A crappy and, upbringing. Yeah, his parents yeah. are both gone. So. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not shaping out good for no, Earl. No, it's not. So, I mean, but to recap, lost both of his parents at a young age. Already has a brain injury. Basically what you said. Yes. All that. Mm-hmm. Earl was described as psychotic prodigy. He would uh, be seen talking to invisible people and showing manic behaviors. It is also said that Earl would watch female family members as they undressed. I feel like with the right kind of help, he could have probably been saved, but it seems like everyone just kind of blew him off. Yeah. In his early teenage years, Earl would frequent bars and brothels in San Francisco, Barbary Coast Red Light District, where he would contract his first STD. Following in his parents' footsteps. <laughs> I guess so. Early teenage years, getting your first STD. I wonder if you get like a an award for that like (laughs) here's your certificate hang that up on your wall oh man as Earl grew into his adult years he would become a very strong man and would even entertain his family by lifting heavy objects (laughs) that is uh Yes. Come over. Earl's going to be lifting something tonight. <laughs> Come take a look at Earl. He's about to lift up. He's going to lift up them, them sandbags over. Look at him go. Classic. <laughs> what are you guys? Hey, what are you guys doing tonight? Well, we ain't got much nothing going on. Y'all ought to come over here. Earl's about to lift some heavy stuff. <laughs> Oh, oh man the entertainment they had back in the day was crazy Earl is going to start entertaining himself at the uh, young age of 18 when in 1915 he was sent to San Quentin after breaking into a cabin 
He was released in 1916, was sent right back in 1917 for petty larceny. He would spend six months there before he was released. But in true Earl fashion, he was sent directly back to jail where he would spend five months before escaping. Later that year, in 1917, Earl joined the military, which I don't know how he did that if he was wanted for escape, but that's for another time. Mm. His military time didn't last long after he went AWOL after just six weeks. He would do this multiple times by just joining different branches of the military under different names. Wow. (laughs) Could you imagine that? I'm tired of the Army. I'm going to the Marines. (laughs) Tired of the Marines. I'm going to the Coast Guard. (laughs) During one of his times in the Navy, Earl was sent to uh, the Napa State Mental Hospital after being found acting erratically. A Navy psychologist said that Earl was, quote, living in a constitutional psychotic state. Mm. Dude, that's kind of scary if you think about it. Yeah. 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 Just a little bit. Always like, just always feeling like, you know, crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure that's not the right word to use for that, but. Earl would go on to spend a little over a year at Napa State Mental Hospital, but his time there was pretty eventful. He would escape three times and would earn the nickname Houdini by the staff. (laughs) Where's Houdini at? (laughs) He gone. (laughs) He gone again. He's out there lifting cars in the parking lot. (laughs) On May 17th, 1919, Earl was released from the mental hospital. And shortly after his release, he would get a janitor job at St. Mary's Hospital, where he used a fake name to acquire the position. While working at the hospital, Earl met Mary Martin and would marry her in August of 1919. Talk about moving fast in a relationship. Uh, a little bit. But like everything in Earl's life, this was uh, short-lived. Mary filed for a divorce after just six months of marriage, citing Earl's strange sexual demands and his violent behavior. Mary also said Earl had odd bathing habits where he would uh, sit in a tub and take a glass of water and just pour it over his toes. <laughs> what? He poured a, a glass of that's, water over his toes. That's, that's the only thing he got wet. <laughs> I'm going to wash my toes off. I'm going to wash my piggies. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Earl, you smell like ass. <laughs> I'm going to wash my toes. <laughs> Oh. On May 19th, 1921, Earl posed as a plumber to gain entry into a residential house. Once in the house, Earl attempted to sexually assault a 12-year-old girl in the basement. But the girl was able to scream loud enough, alerting her brothers and scaring Earl off. Earl was caught just hours later while riding on a trolley. He was sent back to Napa State Mental Hospital where he would spend four years before being discharged yet again in 1925. Mm. On February 20th, 1926, Earl went to a house that was for rent and posed as Roger Wilson. Shortly after viewing the apartment, Earl strangled Clara Newman, a 60-year-old wealthy landlady. After strangling her, Earl would rape her corpse. So now we are dealing with uh, necrophilia. Yeah, that's gross. That's disgusting. Yeah. On June 26, 1926, Earl strangled and raped 63-year-old Lillian St. Mary in San Francisco. Exactly two weeks later, Earl went to Santa Barbara where he met 53-year-old Ollie Russell and would strangle her with a cord in her boarding house. Mm. An autopsy was done and found that she was sexually assaulted after she was dead. Wow. On August 16th, 53-year-old Mary Nebbett was found by her husband in a vacant apartment. She had been strangled and was also raped. Mary's husband was considered a suspect but was quickly cleared of her murder. Multiple witnesses said they seen a dark man with very long arms lurking outside the apartment where Mary worked. After this information became available, the newspaper started referring to Earl as the Gorilla Killer. 
because of his long arms. Oh, that's where it came from. There you go. Earl would leave California for Portland, Oregon later that year. When he arrived in Portland, he met with 35-year-old Beta Withers. Beta's body was found in a steamer trunk by her teenage son. Earl strangled and raped her as well. Mm. I'm not exactly sure what a steamer trunk is. It's like a, it's a, one of those trunks. That steams? <laughs> well, yeah, they just call it a steamer trunk, but it's, it's a trunk. It's like a, you put your stuff in it. Oh, okay. Fancy. Yeah. The very next day, Earl would murder 59-year-old Virginia Grant. Her body was found stuffed in the furnace in the basement of a vacant house. Earl is a very busy man. Oh, yeah, he is. I feel like that's all he does is go around killing people. He's just a killer. Mm -hmm. That's like his occupation. Yeah. He's just a killer. Gorilla killer. You're just doing your job. (laughs) Kill (laughs) On October 21st, landlady Mabel Fluke disappeared while showing an apartment for rent. Her body was found several days later. She had been strangled with a scarf. With no slowing down in sight, Earl left Portland and moved back to San Francisco. I mean, don't be a landlady that shows a property to a killer. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is didn't like this was back in the ni- early 1900s, but like didn't it recently just get changed where like like real the realtors now like have like do like special stuff to where they're not with a single person in a house? Probably. I mean, yeah, maybe. Because there was one not that long ago that the lady was murdered, the realtor, and two people, husband and wife, came and looked at the house and killed her. Ooh, I didn't hear about that. And that's a... It's a sketchy it's job. Oh, I yeah. don't want to be with somebody in some random-ass house. That you don't right. know? Yeah. All you gotta do is call, like, yeah, I'd like to take a look at this house. They'd be mad as hell because they'd come in to look at one of my houses and I'd uh-huh. have my AR strapped across my chest. Like, what up? <laughs> Y'all ready to look at this house? Yeah. Let me show you the the, the kitchen. You're just going to love it. So. You're going to love the kitchen. Don't mind my AR-15. <laughs> and I want you guys to stay in front of me, too. <laughs> if that's okay with you. Good? Yeah, just take a left down that hallway right there. Yeah. Okay. That would be a high-pressured cell. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> you going to buy it or not? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. We love it. We love the property. <laughs> Never mind the sewage in the basement. <laughs> so uh, once in San Francisco, Earl wasted no time getting back into murdering. Uh, 56-year-old Anna Edmonds was raped and murdered on November 18th. So he, I mean, from October to November, he's right back at it. Just yeah. moving locations. Uh. You don't play. After the failed rape and murder of a 28-year-old pregnant woman in Burlingham, California, Earl moved back to Portland, where he murdered Blanche Myers in her home. Police were able to lift fingerprints from Blanche's iron bedpost. After the recent murder in Portland... Earl hopped on a train and went to Vancouver, Washington. Mm. Love that West Coast, don't he? He's a traveling uh, man. Yeah. He's a rambling man. <laughs> and Earl, he gets around. <laughs> In Washington, Earl would strangle and rape Florence Monks, a wealthy widow. Earl packed up and began hitchhiking east, where he would end up in Council Bluffs, Iowa. I mean, I'm in Council Bluffs, Iowa. I want a magnet. <laughs> Give me a t-shirt, Earl. On December 23rd, Earl strangled 41-year-old Almira Berard with a t-shirt. Initially, the police ruled her murder as a suicide until it was found that she had been raped. Because a lot of people will just, you know, strangle themselves with a t-shirt. Right. Oh, I know. Right. It reminds me of a gentleman we covered before where... The prostitute was strangled, and they said, "Actually, she died a crack. Huh? Yes, oh, I yeah. remember that. Yep. That was early on. This is not very smart. No. It's not good policing, buddy. Nope. Two days after Christmas, 23-year-old Bonnie Pace was raped and murdered by Earl and was found in the upstairs bedroom of her home by her husband. So, where's the husband at while she's getting raped and murdered? He's at work. How? Mm. Two days after Christmas, you shouldn't be at work. (laughs) 
Not yeah. everybody gets weeks off like you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's back at, it's back in the day too. They probably like got an hour off for Christmas. Like, go celebrate the Lord and get get right back. Here. <laughs> You've got stuff to do. <laughs> So the next murder, Earl definitely took it to a whole different level. On December 28th, he entered the home of Germania Harpin, a 28-year-old mother. After making his way into her home, he strangled her and then raped her post-mortem. After killing Germania, he went and got eight-month-old Robert and strangled him with a diaper. Wow. Both of their bodies would be discovered by Germania's husband, after he returned home from work that night. So now you just took it to a whole different level. Oh, yeah. Now eight, you're killing kids. Eight mm-hmm. months old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you are a big bag of uh, douchery mm-hmm. in the first place, but. Yeah. And yes. you take out an eight month old. Hey, all, all deals are off the table now, buddy. Mm-hmm. Earl began moving further and further east. Next, he ended up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he met and murdered 53-year-old landlady Mary McConnell. Next, he would go to Buffalo, New York, where he would commit more murders. Then from Buffalo, he would travel to Detroit, Michigan, where he would meet boarding house manager Fannie Mae and her boarder, Maureen Atorthy. Both of their bodies were discovered by a tenant when he went to Fannie's to pay his rent. That'd be awful. Go pay your rent. Some somebody be a knock on the door. Hello, Fanny. I'm here to pay mm-hmm. my rent. Yeah. Look inside and just two dead people. Oh yeah. That'd be uh, awful. Unless yeah. you're also a douchebag and you're like, mm, just save me a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> Go back to your pocket. And leave. <laughs> Earl possibly has the best story of how he was captured. The police thought he was somewhere in Canada when a man matching his description was spotted just above the North Dakota border in good old Manitoba. Earl used the name Virgil Wilson and was so convincing that the sheriff thought they had the wrong guy. Wow. Earl was sent to the local jail where he escaped and would catch a train. But as luck would have it, that same train he was on was carrying member of the Winnipeg Police Department and he was arrested. Nice. How shitty would that be? You jump on a train, you're like, I'm getting out of here. Uh-huh. And the whole like Winnipeg Police Department's on the same train <laughs> as you. Like, what up, dude? Yep. Earl was then taken by train to the Winnipeg Police Department, where it is said that over 4,000 spectators were there to get a glimpse of him. Once back in the United States, Earl confessed to the killings, saying, quote, I only do my lady killings on Saturday nights. What? What a piece of crap. (laughs) But he would then go on to retract his statement, saying he didn't do any of the killings, even though witnesses from the United States and Canada both identified him. Earl was sent back to Winnipeg to stand trial for the murders he committed there. He was shaggy. It wasn't him. (laughs) That was such a bad dad joke. It was was (laughs) not a good one. (laughs) On November 25th, 1927, the jury deliberated for a whopping 45 minutes and found Earl guilty and sentenced him to death. Nice. And that's where we all were hoping that was probably going to go. They kill a lot of people. There's a ton. I mean, I lost count. I mean, we glanced over a couple of them like, yeah, he killed a bunch of people here, and then he went to Michigan and killed some people, and then he went there. Right. I mean, he, this guy's responsible for quite a few killings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They finally caught up with him. Yep. Good, Good. old Canada. Canada, of all places, was like, hey. Frickin' Canada. Them Canucks. Yeah, yeah. It was like, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> hey. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> talking about. Hey, you, you're gonna, you're gonna talk about uh, <laughs> we Earl. Just, we just lost our six followers in Canada because <laughs> I love Canada. Man. I love them. They have horrible bacon. Anyways. What? I love their bacon. It's ham. It's ham. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't ba- bacon, Canada. That's ham. <laughs> Cut the crap. <laughs> so uh, less than two months later, after the jury said, hey, you guilty, you won't die. On January 13th, 1928, at 7.30 a.m., Earl was executed by a hanging at the Vaughn Street Jail in Winnipeg. Good. His final words were, 
quote, I forgive those who have wronged me. <laughs> yeah, that dude is crazy. <laughs> wronged you. You know who I forgive? All you people that wronged me. <laughs> They're like, but sir, you killed uh, a crap load of people. He's like, and you killing me. <laughs> I'll forgive you, though. Psycho. That is the story of the gorilla killer, Earl Nelson. Wow. My question to you is, could the state of California have done a better job from the start, or did they ultimately let him down by not seeming to care early on? Dustin Rex? Uh, California, as usual, screwed up. <laughs> I knew that's what that was going. <laughs> yeah. Ca- uh, California and uh, old Gavin DeGraw over there. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin's not even there. Nineteen twenty. <laughs> no, I think the I think the state of California failed him. I mean, if you had got this dude help, all they kept saying was, "Oh, he's this, he's this." You know, yeah. like he's just, you know, whatever. He's this. Yeah, he's like they, he's they just like they're saying like, oh, he's he's crazy. They'll he'll grow out of it. Let him go. He's crazy. Yeah, they didn't want to send him for help. But what help do you? I mean, we're, this is early 1900s. But just they could have got, got him when he, they could have got him when he was little and done know? what? Like maybe helped him, gave him some therapy or something. I don't know. What do they this do? Early 1900s. They probably like they're like. I mean, we've done stories that, back in the day where they're like, you know how you fix them? You beat the devil out of them. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Just beat the devil right out of them. <laughs> Come here, Earl. We're going to beat the devil out of you. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, that's a it's a that's a tricky, tricky situation. Oh, yeah. They probably uh, they probably did him a little bit of an injustice by not doing you know more Mm -hmm. what they could have done I you know again during that time period I don't know but he definitely uh, brought his reign of terror across the uh, United States and into our brothers up north the Canadians a little brother oh my god (laughs) but yeah I mean they should have done a better job from they should, for sure. That's the bottom line. We all agree on that. So, yep. That, ladies and gentlemen, was your episode. Nice. Rex? Yep. Uh, go to our Facebook page, give us a like, any comments, ideas, questions. Email us at eviltransgression at gmail.com, and we will answer the following episode. And if you are listening right now, go to Apple Podcasts right now and leave us a review. Just do it. We need as many as we can get. If we reach a thousand reviews on Apple, I will send you a picture of Josh's titties. <laughs> so, everybody, do it. Everybody gets oh, one. Man. Also, you can go to eviltransgression.com and check out our uh, all of our links on there. You know, there's a tip jar, Patreon, yep. all that good stuff. So, let's head on over there. Sweet. And if we get 10 tips in the tip jar... I'll send you a picture of me strangling Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to get it. <laughs> so share this podcast with those you love. Yes. Let them know, hey, these guys make me happy. Mm-hmm. And also, real quick, let us know what you thought about the, if you're on Patreon, let us know what you thought about the little thing we put up on there, a little episode. A little beyond evil. A little yeah. beyond. A little beyond. A little look. A little look at what happens in between episodes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Between the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it's called. <laughs> between the cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You done before this gets any uh, more weird? <laughs> between. <laughs> yes, I'm done. I think so. Yeah. Go and buy a t shirt, an evil transgression t shirt. Put that bad boy on. Send us a Send picture. A pic, yep. So you can be featured on the page. Like, look at these awesome people mm-hmm. in the evil mob. Yep. yep. Also, when you throw that bad boy on, you get superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you'll go to the store and they'll be like, oh my God, I love that show. And you say, <laughs> I got superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> you mow your grass faster. <laughs> <laughs> Babysit harder. <laughs> All right. 
Yeah. And we're done. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'd say so. (laughs) But it's all true. I mean, that stuff really happens. I've got one on right now. Yeah, you do. And while Dustin's got a hoodie on, and it's 87 degrees, it feels like, in in the studio right now. Um, I'm I'm on fire, and he's not. I mean, even outside, it's 55, so it's, it's pretty warm. Too warm for a hoodie. It's beautiful. So beautiful. Okay. Okay. Until next time, Evil Mob. See ya. See ya. Peace.